Atrial fibrillation is a heart rhythm disorder. In fact, it is the most common heart rhythm disorder that we treat uh, in our clinics. Up to about 2.5% of patients in the UK, so about 1.5 million individuals currently live with and have a diagnosis of atrial fibrillation. Simplistically, it's a condition whereby the rhythm of the top chambers, the atria, becomes disorganized, and that leads to the heart being more irregular and the heartbeat being faster. This can lead to a number of symptoms because the heart becomes less efficient in pumping blood because of the irregularity. It can cause a number of symptoms like breathlessness, palpitations, awareness of the fast heartbeat, tiredness, lethargy, and it can also increase the risk of blood clots and strokes. So that's atrial fibrillation. In order to make a diagnosis of atrial fibrillation, we need to record the electrical activity of the heart to show that the rhythm of the patient is atrial fibrillation. But at an easier level, you can pick up atrial fibrillation just by checking your pulse. We often say to patients who can feel their own pulse to sometimes see whether the rhythm in their pulse in their wrist is regular or irregular. And GPs, other doctors can do that as the first line to try and pick up atrial fibrillation. If there's any suspicion that the pulse is irregular, then we can do something called an ECG or electrocardiogram, which measures the electric activity of the heart using little stickers and electrodes on the surface of the chest to confirm that. There are other ways that we can do it, including wearing a heart monitor that has a smaller number of leads that they can wear for 24 hours or for up to two weeks to monitor the heart rhythm, to pick up this irregularity of the heart rhythm. Finally, with the expansion of wearable technology, this can now also be picked up, for example, using an Apple Watch that records a single lead ECG, or also other technologies like the Fitbit that picks up irregularities. And many of our patients now come to us through an alert, for example, on the Apple Watch that tells them they have atrial fibrillation, and then we confirm that using an ECG. The causes of atrial fibrillation are often multifold. There isn't a single direct cause that leads to atrial fibrillation. It is a combination of factors, including factors that you can't control, like your age and your genetics, which you cannot control, in combined with other factors that you can control. For example, your weight, alcohol consumption, exercise activity, uh, and other conditions like high blood pressure. So all of these things combine together to increase someone's risk of developing atrial fibrillation. But it's not a single factor. There's many factors that are at play and many factors that the patient can try and address. There are a couple of considerations when we think about treating a patient with atrial fibrillation. There are almost two separate conditions that I tell my patients. Firstly, we want to reduce the risk of blood clots and strokes because atrial fibrillation predisposes to blood clots and strokes. And the very vast majority of patients will be prescribed a medication called a blood thinner that makes the blood less sticky and less likely to clot and that reduces the chances of them having a stroke going forwards. It depends on the individual patient, but the majority of patients will require a blood thinner, although there are some minority of patients who are otherwise young and healthy who may not need one. The second consideration is to help the patient with the symptoms. I mentioned earlier that atrial fibrillation can cause a number of symptoms like palpitations, breathlessness, tiredness, et cetera, et cetera. So we could, at the very lowest level, prescribe some medications to control the heart rate so it's not too fast to make sure the patient is less symptomatic and has less troubling symptoms. We could also give medications to try and reset the heart rhythm to get the patient to revert to a normal rhythm using drugs that we call antiarrhythmic drugs. Next line is to do something physical to try and reset the heart rhythm. We can do something called a cardioversion. And a cardioversion is a very minor procedure 
done under anesthetic where the patient is put to sleep and using two pads placed across the chest, we deliver a single electrical shock through the heart muscle to reset the electrics of the heart to bring that back to normal. And then there's the final step called catheter ablation. This is a minimally invasive keyhole procedure we put little tubes or catheters into the vein in the leg and pass them up to the heart. And then we do something called ablation, which is controlled destruction of heart muscle, either by heating or by cooling the heart muscle to modify what's going on in the atria to reduce the likelihood of it coming back. So depending on how bad your symptoms are, in discussion with your doctor, you can have either medications, cardioversions or ablation, really depending on you as an individual and, and your medical history, your likelihood of success of the treatments, as well as your symptoms. There are several things that a patient can do to avoid atrial fibrillation. Uh, atrial fibrillation risks increase by several lifestyle decisions and lifestyle factors. So people who are very overweight have an increased risk of atrial fibrillation. Patients who drink lots of alcohol are at an increased risk of atrial fibrillation. Some people who have sleep disorders are at increased risk of atrial fibrillation. So if you want to avoid it, you can treat what we call the risk factors of atrial fibrillation. So what you should do is to try and lose weight and get down to a normal weight if you're overweight. You can moderate your alcohol consumption so you don't drink above the normal limits. You can increase your exercise activity so that you are fitter and reduce your risk. If you have any sleep disorders like sleep apnea, you should get that treated. If you have high blood pressure, you should get that treated. So all the predisposing factors can be treated to reduce your risk of developing atrial fibrillation. Individuals with atrial fibrillation can live very fulfilling normal lives. So many of my patients who have the condition manage it very well in close conjunction with their physician and their doctor. So it's all about arriving at a care plan that reduces the risk of bad events like strokes by taking the right medications, choosing the right level of treatment, be it drugs, cardioversion, or ablation, that is best to try and reduce your symptoms at the lowest risk to the patient, and then having some ownership of the disease by doing all the things to reduce the likelihood of progression. So if you have atrial fibrillation, it can progress from a paroxysmal form, which is the intermittent form, to the persistent form, where it's there all the time. So the patient can take some ownership in modifying their lifestyle, losing weight, treating their other conditions like high blood pressure, exercising more, reducing alcohol. It's a whole package that will be involved a very close dialogue between the patient and the physician going through many years to help them live with it and in fact live very fulfilling lives with atrial fibrillation.